Now, a News 2 special presentation. Honoring Black History. Sponsored locally by Joy Law Firm. Recognizing the struggle and celebrating the strength of Africans and African Americans. Hello, I'm Carolyn Murray. The images you see right here are of Tomalyn Martin Polite's visit to Sierra Leone, West Africa in 2005. We begin our one hour News 2 Black History Month special with a report revealing how the Martin family discovered their beginnings in this country and their deep rooted connection to their homeland. As Tomalyn Martin Polite and her husband Antoine walked through the International African American Museum at Gatson's Wharf, they examined faces, places, exhibits, and artifacts. Her appreciation for history heightened because a stranger knocked on the door of her family's home more than 30 years ago. When I was 19 years old, Ed Ball came to the home and presented our family with documents and information that he had found in his research of his family's plantation. Ed Ball was an author and researcher who was able to trace the Martins family history nearly 250 years. He was able to show us the unbroken paper trail of a young girl, 10 years old, that was kidnapped from Sierra Leone and brought to South Carolina. And his family purchased her, gave her the name Priscilla. And who was Priscilla to you? Priscilla is my seventh generation grandmother. So she is my great, 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 great grandmother. Polite explained her father, Thomas Martin, had been working on a family tree, so the discovery was stunning and welcome. My dad was elated. He was just at a loss for words because he had also been trying to trace our family's history and you know, came across stumbling blocks. Describe Ed Ball, this person who was coming to your house with this life-changing information. You can tell that he had some trepidation about coming and giving this information to a family, you know, an African-American family. You know, this was history. This was not something that he did. This was information that he found through his family's records. They kept very meticulous records. He wanted to find out what happened to those descendants of the slaves that his family had owned. The discovery of Priscilla's descendants in the Low Country caught the attention of Joe Apala, a scholar and researcher of the connection between Gullah Geechee culture and West Africa. He organized a trip to Sierra Leone for Tomlin and her family, chronicled in this documentary made by the Martin family. From the food to the music, um, to the, the speech, to the actual um, traditions, uh, for example, what we would call red rice here, it was jollof rice. Um, they had uh, the sweet grass baskets that we make here, they had the same baskets there woven and, and it was just, just to see those similarities and the speech, the lingo, the language uh, was Creole so that all of the different tribes could communicate. And although I couldn't speak it well or understand a lot of it, I did understand some things because it was very similar to the Gullah Geechee language that I hear in Charleston. One of the things that happened was a portrait being made trying to get a visual of how this girl may have looked. Dana Coleman was commissioned to uh, create this portrait. He used a portrait of myself when I was 10 and used images of Sierra Leone girls, Sierra Leonean girls who were about 10 years old and morphed the pictures together to create what we would feel would be Priscilla. Sadly, Thomas Martin passed away before Tomlin and her family traveled to Sierra Leone. But Tomlin says her father's spirit was with them as they witnessed a testament to the survival of African culture in America. 
I spoke with Ed Ball, who teaches at Yale University, about his book *Slaves in the Family*, which won the National Book Award and changed the American conversation about race. When I was a young adult, I respected what was a taboo around the subject of slavery.、Uh, I did not want to. Open that box, if you like, because I knew that、uh, it was too difficult and too full of shame for me. The Ball family controlled more than a dozen rice plantations in the Low Country for about two hundred years, and enslaved close to four thousand people. Over that time, on those rice plantations, Ball also told me about a conversation he had. The year was 1999. He spoke with then Charleston Mayor Joe Riley, and he said, "I read your book. It's very powerful. What do you think about establishing an African American museum here in Charleston?" And I said, Mayor Riley, I think that's a great idea. Now, that was 25 years ago, and、uh, the museum opened last year, and、uh, it's a very good thing it did. The International African American Museum opened June 2023 at Gatson's Wharf. The two-acre waterfront plot of land on the peninsula was a point of embarkation for millions of enslaved Africans. Dr. Tanya Matthews, chief executive officer of the museum, says the Martin family history being linked seven generations is rare, but it doesn't have to be. It's not common, but it doesn't have to be as uncommon as it currently is. One of the things we've learned in recent years is it is possible to trace the genealogy of African Americans back generation after generation, and to have names. And while there is a lot of trauma in those times, there's so much more joy and resilience, particularly when you can find the name, the ability to say the name, or even to find a space or an energy, and perhaps you are giving that descent. A name. So all of these things are really important and really critical, and most importantly, they are now possible. Tomlin says knowing her family's beginning gives her peace that the struggle to strength is worth the journey. When you think about these Africans that were taken, kidnapped from their home, and the last piece of soil that they touched in their country. And then this is the first piece of soil they touched in the United States. It changed their lives forever. Celebrating the life of activist educator Septima Clark, we will tell you some of the great achievements of the woman known as the mother of the civil rights movement. Walking down Wentworth Street in downtown Charleston, you will see College of Charleston's Kappa Sigma Fraternity House. The property is where Septima Poinsett Clark was born, May 3, 1898. The American educator and civil rights activist played a crucial chapter in Charleston's history, but her impact was much larger than the Low Country. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called Septima Clark the mother of the movement. And in 2010, Charleston Mayor Joe Riley changed the name of the Crosstown Expressway to the Septima P. Clark Parkway. Christina Lobo tells us how Septima Clark served as an advocate and leader until she passed away in 1987, and how her legacy lives on. She was that quiet, trailblazing female. An educator. She was instrumental in advancing the importance of civics education. Ann Pillar of the civil rights movement, Septima P. Clark, we call her Mama Sep. Was an important person to many, including her granddaughter Yvonne Clark Rines. It's amazing that they still find what she did in her life as a teaching tool to them or an example for them. In their lives, and 
people are still acknowledging that. It's important that Charleston um, in South Carolina knows, and I think a lot of people do know, how amazing Septima Clark was and how we're still benefiting from her life and work today. Patricia Williams Dockery says she learned a lot about Clark when the Charleston chapter of the League of Women Voters and Pure Theater approached her to write the play Septima. Septima Clark was not allowed to teach in Charleston County Schools um, when she got her licensure to teach from the Avery Institute, as it was called at that time. Um, she could not teach in Charleston City Schools because only white teachers were um, allowed to teach Black students. So she taught on Johns Island. And then ultimately, when she was able to teach in Charleston County Schools and she didn't renounce her membership in the NAACP, she was fired. Um, but none of that stopped her desire to lift as she climbed. Clark dedicated her life to education, fighting to allow black teachers in classrooms in Charleston and equal pay for equal work for black educators in South Carolina. It wasn't just about her. It was about the bigger picture. It was about all black people. It was about, you know, standing up to injustice. And um, I think um, that's a lesson to all of us. Her work with the citizenship schools and how she taught people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. about organizing and how to help people understand the importance of voting can be seen to this day. It cannot be understated because her work, her blueprint, you know, really turned the tide and she, um, her work is directly responsible for like, by the time the, the Voting Rights Act passed, like, uh, close to a million Southern Blacks who had never voted before were not only registered, but voting. And so um, we owe that to her. Zinnia Cummings is the lead actress who is portraying Septima. Also born and raised in Charleston, Cummings shares who Septima Clark is to her. I think the best way to describe her is just a teacher. Um, it surpasses educator um, because, of course, she was an educator, but to be a teacher truly means to, to truly have the desire to instill something in the learners that you're, you're teaching. Because she taught way more than just children, right? She taught adults. She taught adults to read and write. She taught adults to understand what they were voting for, how to vote, how to register to vote. To me, she is the epitome of what a teacher should be. She surpasses someone who's just giving you material. She really delved deep into these people's lives and asked them questions, and that was reflected in how she chose to educate them. So she's a teacher. She's, to me, a saint. She is the epitome of, like, a good human. Sharon Gracie is the director of the play, which is told through monologues, music, and stories that honors the moments of Septima's life. Her impact is felt today. I mean, we know that there are so many African-American politicians, especially through the 80s and the 90s, who really had their roots tied into the citizenship schools, where we really see huge social movements and so much progress based on what Septima Clark did. So, I, you know, I'm hoping that there's just a much greater appreciation for who she was and that we are really proudly and broadly claiming her, not only as a Charlestonian, but just a great American woman who deserves to be broadly known. The civil rights leader, educator, grandmother, and hero to many. Know that if my grandmother was alive today, she would be out there teaching you how to be strong, how to get out the vote, how to protect your children, and how to love your family. Still inspiring a younger generation of activists. I'm trying my best to hold back tears now, so um, she, she's just, she's a memory worth having. In Charleston, Christina Lobo, Count On Two. Pure Theater will present Septima during their Low Country tour at the Cannon Street Arts Center beginning Wednesday, February 28th through Saturday, March 2nd. You can find tickets and more information on our website, countonto.com.
expanding Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. Hear from the nephew of Dr. King in a one-on-one -on -one interview. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, dedicated their lives to changing the world. Octavia Mitchell sat down in a one-on-one -on -one interview with Isaac Newton Ferris, the nephew of the civil rights icons, as he works to honor, protect, and expand his family's legacy. Uncle and male, Dr. King. Mr. Isaac Newton Ferris' mother is a sister of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ferris was nine days from his sixth birthday when his uncle was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, 1968. What would you like to say to the world about your uncle's legacy? It's a human legacy. It's, it's not a black legacy. It's, it's a legacy uh, that embraces everyone. Born in Atlanta, Georgia, Ferris graduated from his uncle's alma mater, Morehouse College. He is a senior fellow at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change in Atlanta and writes a syndicated column. Founded by his aunt Coretta Scott King, the King Center is a global destination resource center and community institution with programs in Atlanta schools. Well, our focus, um, our current CEO, my cousin, uh, Bernice, uh, my uncle's uh, youngest child, um, has really made it a point of focusing on the upcoming generation. So we have a lot of uh, programs for, for uh, we're heavily involved in the Atlanta public school system w with kids, uh, trying to inculcate them to, to the philosophy. Farris says he is proud of the work the King Center is doing to honor his uncle and aunt's legacy. They also work to ensure the King holiday is celebrated and respected in the right way. After the King holiday was created, Aunt Coretta, Coretta Scott King, went back to the Congress and said, hey, you know, we need, we, we need to make some changes to the holiday. We need to attach an official legal designation of, of, for, for the King holiday because what was happening was the very thing that my uncle would not be happy about. It was turning into a day of solely hero worship, okay? And if my uncle were here, he'd be like, you know, okay, that's nice, but if you really want to honor me, if you really want to, you know, uh, honor my work, honor my life sacrifice, don't sit around talking about <laughs> my, you know, my, my personal uh, work uh, and don't, you know, just uplift me personally, uh, uplift the work. So what Uncle Red asked for and what the Congress and the president signed into law was the King holiday is a day of service, first off, right? And it's a day where on that day, whatever that is, you're supposed to figure out something that you, to do that benefits someone else, not yourself. Ferris has strong thoughts on South Carolina's lack of a hate crimes law. Oh, South Carolina needs a hate crimes bill. We are confronted with hate now more than ever before. And it's just not racial hate. It's religious hate. It, it, it's, it's sexual diversity hate. Um, it's political hate. Um, it, we're, we're, we're surrounded by it. So for South Carolina to be not a part of that discussion in the right way, not stepping up and saying in this state, we will not allow this to take place and, and, and happen to any citizen is almost it's saying South Carolina endorses what, what, what's happening. And his message for everyone who strives to live his uncle's dream, be involved in a way that works for you. You know, you don't have to run for office to be involved in your community. Um, you don't have to be a pastor of a church to be involved in your community. You don't have to be a, a government employee to be involved in your community. Um, but be involved in your community. Octavia Mitchell, Count On Two. A historical icon visits Patriots Point. One of the nation's first African-American fighter pilots tells us about his experience as a Tuskegee Airman.
The first African-American fighter pilots to fight combat in World War II visited the USS Yorktown on Mount Pleasant for a meet and greet with the public. Delilah James spoke with a veteran about making history and keeping our country safe. Tuskegee! Lieutenant Richardson served in the military from 1944 to 1946. During his service, the civil rights movement was underway, paving the way for Tuskegee Airmen, the country's first group of African-American military pilots. An outstanding combat record inspired revolutionary reform in the armed services. That refers to the fact that in uh, 1948, President Harry Truman issued Executive Order to effect ended segregation throughout the military. Lieutenant Richardson shared stories about how his unit contributed to the success of the Second World War. And with, with segregation in throughout the military, men with ability and character could rise up to whatever level th th they desired. And once the military was desegregated, the desegregation started uh, flowing throughout, throughout our country. And those who came to listen said they were inspired by Lieutenant Richardson's story and the contribution that the Tuskegee Airmen made to our country for generations to come. It is a privilege to meet somebody like this that really, as many people notice, is a trailblazer. So we can't forget the sacrifice these guys made. Lieutenant Richardson plans to continue advocating for the greater of Philadelphia chapter of Tuskegee Airmen. Reporting at Patriots Point, I'm Delilah James, Count On Two. Creating a safe haven for African-American children, how a ban helped shape the future of hundreds of children who grew up at Jenkins Orphanage. Now, a News 2 special presentation, honoring black history sponsored locally by Joy Law Firm. Since 1891, children have been taken in and taken care of by the founder and staff of Jenkins Orphanage, now known as Jenkins Youth and Family Village. The mission has always been to educate and empower young people. 133 years later, the music and mission are still a part of the Jenkins legacy. Back in the 1920s, my father was the superintendent of the Jenkins Orphanage. Two decades later, in the 1940s, Dr. Ben Chavis says he was enraptured in the sounds of music that were unlike anything he'd ever heard. Uh, the Jenkins Band, the Jenkins Orphanage Band was world renowned. Uh, the brass band, no one had ever seen brass instruments improvised, improvisation of the Jenkins Orphanage Band actually was the help the evolution of jazz in America. It was the late 1940s. Chavis was a child himself. I was born in 1948. Mm -hmm. So during the uh, late 40s, early 50s, I would come to Jenkins Orphanage. And I was always so impressed with the uh, high aspirations of these orphans. But unlike Chavis, who was in the care of his own parents, the children in the Jenkins band had been living in the streets. Challenge, but music compensated for their challenge. Music compensated for their poverty. Orphan black children rescued from the streets of Charleston by Daniel Joseph Jenkins, a formerly enslaved man who became a minister and a businessman. Reverend Jenkins is said to have boldly asked the all-white Charleston City Council to use a warehouse next to the city of Charleston jail to establish an orphanage on King Street. The council members said yes, and the orphanage was established in 1891. The truth is, the quality of life of the orphans at Jenkins Orphanage was very high quality. Reverend Jenkins made sure they had everything. Uh, good clothes, good shoes, good textbooks. I met young people that were speaking Greek, were translating the New Testament into Greek. I mean, uh, this is a, a story that's really not told because a lot of times when people think of orphanages, they think of people who um, are less fortunate. 
But I would say that the orphans that attended Jenkins Orphan were very fortunate to have a founder like Mr. Jenkins. The Jenkins Orphanage Band played all over the world. They played at the inauguration of President Theodore Roosevelt and President William Taft. They performed during the St. Louis World's Fair. They toured the country extensively through the 1910s and 1920s, playing shows from coast to coast. They even played in Paris, Berlin, Rome, London, and Vienna. <laughs> the grandson of the founder of Jenkins Orphanage, tough as Zimbabwe, talked about his family's legacy. What did you know about your family's history growing up as a child? Yeah, my father would um, tell me of um, our great-grandfather, uh, Reverend Daniel Joseph Jenkins, and all the great accomplishments he was able to do, and um, how we have to come to Charleston and, and visit family and campus and learn the history. And, um, and also, he would talk about uh, his uncle, which is um, Edmund Thorne Jenkins, and how he would uh, want me to work on his music. Bobway's interpretation of his great uncle, Edmund Thornton Jenkins, composition Charlestonia Rhapsody, was featured during the 2024 Color of Music Festival. The piece is considered one of the greatest musical tributes to Jenkins' hometown of Charleston. And Zimbabwe knows about music and bands. He is the keyboardist for the Saturday Night Live house band. He talked about getting his big break on SNL when he connected with a professor at NYU. I developed a good reputation in, in the department, you know, as you know, a guy who does his work and is on time and you know, has talent and uh, potential. So he said, oh, give this guy the toughest uh, audition. Um, and then I played some of my Chopin and, and then I played some jazz and played some of the, the funk. All the different skills that I was able to accumulate um, you know, made it an ideal fit for me. Dr. Karen Chandler is the co-founder of the Charleston Jazz Initiative, a jazz history and research project that documents the careers of South Carolina musicians who helped shape music history in America and Europe. When we started the Charleston Jazz Initiative in 2003, um, we knew that we had a responsibility to document um, the history for us of jazz in Charleston the history of so many great musicians who came out of the Jenkins Orphanage and went on to play with Count Basie and Jimmy Lunsford and, and uh, Duke Ellington and so many of the big band leaders. Um, what we did not know is, when we first got started, is that there would be a composer whose name was Edmund Thornton Jenkins, who was both a classically trained composer and who also composed jazz and popular music as well. And so here we are um, celebrating his musical legacy. Dr. Ben Chavis, a trailblazer for human, civil, and environmental justice as the field director for the Million Man March and the former executive director of the NAACP, says the memory of the Jenkins Orphanage Band have guided his steps professionally and personally. He says their story is history. Every time I hear jazz, I think about uh, the Jenkins Orphanage Band. Being back in 2024 uh, reminded me that uh, difficulties or even obstacles that may be put in your path, you can not only transcend those obstacles, but you can still do something great. And so I, I think that this part of the world, this part of South Carolina, this is part of history. It's just not, I know this is Black History Month, so, but I tell people all the time, Black history is American history. And what happened at the Jenkins Orphanage is American history. A journey through history for locals and tourists, we explore the places and stories of black Charlestonians.
Celebrating Black History Month means recognizing the contributions of African Americans. Local tours are an excellent way to learn about the Low Country's storied history. Octavia Mitchell takes us on a journey through history as she travels along with a tour that highlights the many contributions and culture of Black Charlestonians. Y'all welcome to Charleston and welcome to Charleston African American Tours. It's a step back in time for a journey to discover Charleston's rich black history. All right, let's get on board. Nathaniel Hutchinson is the owner of Charleston African American Tours. One of six tours in Charleston focus on the contributions of blacks in the city and the Gullah Geechee culture. Hutchinson begins the tour by highlighting his heritage. Mom always said that she was born the first year of freedom. This was her husband, Benjamin Joseph Whitesides. During the course of the tour, Hutchinson takes guests through Gullah culture, food, music, language, and customs. So y'all ready to get started? We're gonna get rolling here. We're gonna give y'all some beautiful history of Charleston Gullah Geechee African American culture. Y'all hold tight. First stop, Mother Emanuel, where Hutchinson focuses on the church's history and the heartbreaking tragedy. Well, Y'all, this was one of the earliest African-American church uh, here uh, in this Charleston area here. I know the story, I just didn't realize it was here. Yes, ma'am, it was here. The Gilliard Center. They discovered that this was once an African-American burial ground. They recovered 36 men, women, and children. But this is what you would have seen posted all along uh, the slave roots here. The tour highlights the iconic craftsmanship of renowned artisan and blacksmith Philip Simmons. In St. John's Reform Episcopal Church. This was the church of our famous iron worker, Mr. Philip Simmons, y'all. Take a look to your left here. Look at that beautiful gate. And Charleston's connection to Barbados. That architectural style came from the, the inhabitants of Barbados oh. because the early Charlestonians came from Barbados. That's right. These are usually early white slave owners. Abolitionists, the Grimke sisters. This is the Grimke sisters. I talk about them during my tour because there were two white women that uh, family were slave owners and they inherited the slave. But guess what they did with their slaves when they became owners of the plantation? They freed their slaves, y'all. The new International African American Museum. Now take a look to your left and you will see our new International African American Museum. And the connection to Gullah food. The major cash crop that built this city was rice. This is what put this city on the map. And guess who grew the rice? Guess who had the knowledge? It would have taken, uh, it would have taken uh, the equivalent of an engineering degree to know how to grow rice. So let's give credit to these people. They were deemed as being savages and unlearned. Including food trivia on how to make hop and John. Field peas. Field peas. Oh, cow peas. We call it cow peas. What, you know why it's called cow peas? Because that's what they fed the cows. You get to understand that the slaves had to augment their diet because they were fed such a poor diet. Business owner Nate Hutchinson retired from state government. He has been rolling his Mercedes Benz Sprinter van tours for 13 years now. And he speaks fluent Gullah. Make the camera my hand just like this, Rachel. I know back here, up and get it on. The Black History Tours also go through the historic East Side community of downtown Charleston. Oh my goodness, we have a blessing today, y'all. They're flying the flag. See the red, black, and green flag up there? Mm -hmm. That's the flag of liberation. Oh. And covers difficult topics like gentrification. But you see two worlds ex coexisting at the same time. Uh, the new residents coming in with the gentrification and some of the older residents still trying to hang on to their life, y'all. And the origins of We Shall Overcome with the history of the cigar factory, which was a cotton mill where black workers walked out in protest over discrimination and poor working conditions. I shall overcome, which the later changed to We Shall Overcome. It became the anthem of the civil rights movement. At the end of the tour, applause. We got the whole picture now of Charleston, I think. There's a lot I didn't know. Uh, yeah. Now I know the Indian origins, the black origins. Oh, the tour was absolutely awesome. Historically, I think this is the best. What gives me joy and tremendous amount of joy is that uh, the interest of the clients. Nothing breeds uh, racism uh, like ignorance. Uh, when people are educated, as a matter of fact, one of my motto is, is to educate, re-educate without hate. 
and to give people an idea that other people made substantial contributions. People need to know about each other's history that they can have a mutual respect for one another. The tour was as if I've met them before. You know, and this is how um, intimate it was in a particular way. What began with a handshake ends with an embrace and moving forward in the future with a clear view of the past. Octavia Mitchell, Count On Two. Mayor Reggie Burgess is the city of North Charleston's first African-American mayor. What it means to be the elected official and what advice he has for the next generation. The city of North Charleston made history back in November, electing Reggie Burgess as the city's first African-American mayor. Mayor Burgess talks about his respect and commitment to the community where he was born and raised. He says he does not take this responsibility lightly. Reggie Burgess grew up in North Charleston, and enjoyed the North Charleston Police Department while he was in his 20s. He rose through the ranks before he was appointed chief in 2018, making history as the city's first black police chief. Then, when longtime mayor Keith Summey announced he was not running for re-election, Reggie Burgess ran for mayor of North Charleston and was elected in November 2023. He says when he was a child, he thought he wanted to be an Olympian because he saw people who looked like him succeeding in sports. He says now the next generation will know they can achieve whatever they aspire, no matter their path. To me, as a young black kid, sports was the, the way out. Sports was the way to elevate yourself. But now we have shown these kids that this is America and America takes care of, of Americans. So it doesn't matter where you're from, you can be the president of the United States, the first African American in, in history, first African American police chief, now the first African American mayor. And I love it but I want you to hold me accountable because I've got to do the work that comes with the title. Mayor Burgess was officially sworn in January 2nd. Outside of the town of Mount Pleasant Municipal Offices stands a marker and a plaque recognizing the town's first African-American police officer, Edmund Jenkins. Jenkins was an enslaved man who joined the U.S. military. He would eventually leave the military but continued a life of service when he was hired as a Mount Pleasant police officer and town marshal from 1890 to 1920. It was extremely uncommon for an African American to be allowed to openly carry a weapon in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Inspector Don Calabrese of the Mount Pleasant Police Department researched historical documents and interviews and said this about Officer Jenkins. Edmund Jenkins was known for his conduct and fairness. He gained respect to the community. It was unheard of for an African American to walk down the street with a gun and in any position of authority, but Edmund Jenkins commanded that respect, and when people saw him, they would say, the chief is coming. A public housing complex in Mount Pleasant is named the Edmund Jenkins Homes, to honor Jenkins's life of service. A senior at Portagout High School makes history. We will introduce you to the student who was the school's first African-American homecoming queen. Portagout has existed in Charleston for more than 155 years. But this year, a high school senior makes history as the school's first African-American homecoming queen. Anna Powers introduces us to a student who says she's humbled to be the first, but excited that she will not be the last. They had a moment of silence where they said, who will be the homecoming queen? And they called my name and I won. That is Amber Wilson de Briano. She is a current senior at Porter Goud, where she's attended school for the past 12 years. It's a school that has a storied reputation of academic excellence and prestige here in the Low Country. And this year, Wilson de Briano marked a major milestone in the school's over 100 year history. I shouldn't dare to dream that I could be the homecoming queen because no other black girl had won before me. 
But when they called my name, I felt like I finally gave kids something to dream about and to know that they can do this too. Bringing change, she acknowledges, goes far deeper than the crown and sparkly dress on homecoming night. She is the co-founder of the Porter Gowd Black Excellence Society, and she embodies that role every day, taking multiple AP classes and, according to her family, maintaining a stellar GPA, also serving as co-president of the Chinese Club, earning the seal of biliteracy twice, and co-creator of Porter Gowd's first art club. Club. She gives credit to a supportive community and family, and yet she is still the first. When I got into high school, I felt like I really had a calling to be somebody who can make a way for black students. And when I was nominated to be homecoming queen, I felt like this was the perfect way to build a legacy and to bring change to the school. Perhaps the most important achievement on Wilson de Briano's already lengthy resume is that she is loved and respected by her peers. Besides being smart, they say she's a good friend. And that's why her classmates voted to make her the homecoming queen. Her story receiving national recognition, rightfully so. She is the first, but as she says, not the last. On homecoming night, I took so many pictures with such young black children and I want them to look at me and believe that this is something that's attainable for them. It felt like finally I can give them some sort of dream and help them. Even if I get to just stand here and wear a crown, it means so much more than just being the queen. My win is not just for me, it's for all of the younger kids. That was Hannah Powers reporting. Amber will be attending Savannah College of Art and Design in the fall, where she will study painting and hopes to own her own business one day and illustrate children's books. Stay with us as we wrap up our one hour Black History Month special, recognizing the struggle and celebrating the strength of African and African Americans. We hope you've enjoyed this News 2 Black History Month special presentation. For additional resources about ancestry and genealogy, you can visit the International African American Museum Center for Family History. We have a link to the website on ours, caltonto.com. Thanks again for watching.